Newt News is brought to you in part by The Village Bank. Your village, your bank. This week on Newton News. The public weighs in on the size and scope of the Riverside Project. Congressman Joseph Kennedy holds a town hall meeting. And happy 4th of July. Hear about the activities the city is sponsoring. Welcome to Newt News for Wednesday, July 3rd, 2019. I'm Jen Adams. The public weighed in with their opinions on the proposed height and scope of the Riverside project. Helen Kim brings us the details of the project and suggestions laid out by residents. The Newton City Council hosted a meeting between the Land Use Committee and Planning and Development Board to discuss the new proposal for transit-oriented development at Riverside Station. The proposal, made by Mark Development, seeks to reinvent the park facility at Riverside into a community center. This center, if approved, will include hotels, office buildings, and condo towers not exceeding 750,000 square feet total and up to 18 stories in height, as well as small green spaces, a civic square, and a line of shops for residents' enjoyment, all placed steps away from Riverside Station. Mark Development aims to create and provide affordable housing, increased opportunities for local businesses, minimize operating energy inside the buildings, and offer temporary and seasonal pop-ups for retail and dining through the project. The Riverside proposal is being met with both support and criticism. The group Livable Newton and some Newton residents have advocated for immediate approval of the proposal, citing affordable housing as immediate must-haves for residents. The proposal provides an opportunity to create a more, diverse, more diverse housing options, including affordable homes and a mixed-use development that we cannot afford to miss. Riverside will provide a new housing option that people of all ages, backgrounds, and occupations are seeking, but cannot find in Newton right now. Others, like Newton resident and teacher Jen Barrigal, expand on the hidden benefits affordable housing made possible by the proposal could really look like. If Newton is truly committed to creating a vibrant community of people with multiple backgrounds and interests, a community that prides itself on its openness and tolerance, then we need to make living here more accessible. And still others of Green Newton agree and take a different turn in supporting the Riverside proposal, stating that if rightly developed, the community center at Riverside could even improve Newton's environment. When we provide housing near mass transit stations, it reduces the number of cars on the road and the associated carbon pollution. When we build dense housing units as opposed to suburban sprawl, we take down fewer trees that sequester carbon. Green Newton further points out the consequences of not going through with the proposal. If we kill this project, like we did the last one by requiring it to be too small to be financially feasible, we will, be, we will miss an opportunity to address the housing crisis, and we will make our greenhouse gas emissions even worse. Still others are firmly against the Riverside project. Newton Lower Falls resident Dan Cooperstein points out the potential side effects nearby Newton residents could suffer from if the proposal is passed, such as the traffic situation. The addition of thousands of vehicles per day on top of what already exists is untenable. Cooperstein spells out what Riverside could damage. People living in the Newton Falls community expect to be able to go food shopping, do errands, and get to their appointments without being blocked on the roadways. Barbara Gruenthal further states that Mark Development failed to file all the requirements of the special permit application, specifically failing to outline a plan for traffic monitoring after the Riverside project is completed. This failure, she asserts, only proves the flimsy legal aspect of the proposal. Uh, it, unless there's something that hasn't been posted on the city's website, it hasn't been filed. This is another element of this being rushed, that we're going forward on special permit application that hasn't even been completed. I don't know how the peer review is going to work on a transportation management plan that doesn't exist. Mark Development's Riverside proposal is garnering attention for the impact it may have on the Newton community. Both supporters and naysayers are speaking out. Regardless, the Land Use Committee and Newton residents are bound to pick one decision soon. 
Congressman Joseph Kennedy held a town hall meeting at Newton North High School. Dozens turned out to hear the congressman's opinion on a variety of topics. Ryan Keaveny has more. So, with that, I'd like to welcome Congressman Kennedy. His leadership and voice and four values are so Congressman Joe Kennedy held his Newton Town Hall event this past Sunday and many residents came to hear what he had to say and interact with the congressman. Kennedy spoke on a wide range of issues, including his thoughts on the president, border control and immigration, and climate change, just to name a few. Congressman Kennedy has a lot of support in the Newton community, and there was plenty of it at his town hall event. Thanks for coming. I figured I'd uh, give you a little bit of a rundown in terms of the two biggest issues that are on my plate at the moment. Kay mentioned them. The impeachment thing, which it sounds like you heard about, um, yeah. and, um, uh, and a trip to the border. Um, I leave tomorrow at about 5 a.m. down to El Paso. Um, so. And I think the biggest takeaway to me uh, was that he's just really on top of it right now. He's, uh, I think, really sort of continued to grow as a congressman as he's been in there, and he's got a complete handle on everything from you know, domestic kitchen table issues to questions about, you know, Haiti and Syria. And, uh, you know, I think you could see it's even a testament just that, you know, you didn't have any uh, huge organized, you know, groups pushing for him, you know, to do this or that today. And I think it's because he's, he's managed it well and he's really fit his district well. Congressman Kennedy held his Newton Town Hall event at Newton North High School, which was free and open to the public. Questions for the congressman were submitted at a question sign-up table and were picked at random. This was a very beneficial event that keeps the dialogue going between the community and Congressman Kennedy. Many in attendance were happy to hear from Congressman Kennedy and hear what he thought about their specific questions. That, um, people really had a chance to talk to him about their issues, but he reinforced where he was. And I think that because people are so concerned about government, hearing from somebody like Joe Kennedy really is strengthening. Uh, you know, he covered a whole range of issues that Newton residents care about, not just climate, but immigration is uh, important. Ryan Caveney, Newton News, Newtonville. If you're sticking around Newton on the 4th of July, start your day at the Newton Center Playground with It's a Kid's Morning. Kids ages 3 to 12 can participate in a grand pet parade decorated doll carriage promenade, teddy bear parade, foot races, and free ice cream, courtesy of Cabot's Ice Cream. At 1 p.m., head over to Albemarle Field for the open air market and amusement rides. There is a craft fair, local business vendors, food trucks, and children's activities. Around 6 p.m., there will be music and dancing. And once it's dark, stay for the fantastic fireworks. More information is available online at newtoncommunitypride.org. For 40 years, Newton's Farmer's Market brings local farmers to you. Every Saturday and Tuesday, grab fresh produce and other items to eat well and show your support by buying local. The Saturday Farmer's Market on Elm Street is open from 9.30 a.m. until 12.30 p.m. The Cold Spring Park Farmer's Market on Tuesdays is open from 1.30 until 6 p.m. It's almost that time of year. The 84th annual St. Mary of Carmen Society Festival begins on July 17th and runs until July 21st at Pellegrini Park in Nonantum. Festival hours are 5 to 11 p.m. Wednesday through Saturday and on Sunday from 4 p.m. to 11 p.m. with rides, games, music, food, and beer. On Sunday, join the St. Mary of Carmen Society Mass at 8 a.m. And at 2 p.m., come out for the procession of St. Mary through the streets of Nonantum with the North End Marching Band. At 10 p.m., the festival will wind down with a candlelight procession to Our Lady's Church and the Flight of the Angel. More information is available online at stmaryofcarmen.org. Autoimmunity is on the rise around the globe with it affecting an estimated 50 million Americans. And diet has been proposed as the risk factor but has been largely unstudied until now. Joining me in the studio to discuss their investigation between diet and autoimmune disorders are Iosef Gerstein, a systems immunologist at J, uh, Ajax Biomedical Fi Foundation, and Dr. Leonardo Ferrara, a molecular immunologist 
and human genome engineer at the Department of Surgery at University of California, San Francisco. Thank you very much for joining me today. This is a very interesting topic and one that, as I stated, hasn't been studied that much. So why did you decide to, to do this study? Well, we decided to do this study because we really wanted to systematically interrogate the relationship between diet and autoimmunity. And as autoimmunity is on the rise with over 50 million cases in America, we thought that looking into the specific foods that can cause, perhaps cause autoimmunity or, or cause a flare-up of symptoms would be a very, very much a value-add product for these patients. This, I mean, and it really is the diet that you found. So how does a diet help or hurt one's molecular setup? Um, for an autoimmune disorder? Well, this is a very interesting question. So autoimmune disease, it's the body at war with itself. Right. It's an immune system somehow escaped proper schooling and you have some T cells which are killing immune cells that recognize and kill your own tissues. For example, in type 1 diabetes, they'll recognize and destroy your pancreatic beta cells that make insulin. And so this system happens, the immune system sees our cells based on these IDs called epitopes. Epitopes are sequences of proteins that are inside your cells and they are presented on the surface of the cells, and so the immune system patrols your body. Mm -hmm. It will recognize and scan those IDs. And if something is wrong, for example, if this epitope is right from a virus or from a cancer cell, it will be killed. Mm -hmm. And in this case, the immune system sees your own epitope as something bad. Right. And so food also has proteins, and so these proteins will get processed by your body and become also epitopes, which in certain cases can be presented in an inflammatory context. For example, it depends on your diet. If you have a high-fat diet, high-sugar diet, processed foods, this could lead to food being presented to your immune system as something dangerous, something right. inflammatory. And then your body will start attacking that or, or itself Correct. in that regard. So uh, what were you looking for, I guess, in foods uh, that we eat, I guess, every day? What kind of foods were you looking for? Well, we started out with a sample of 14 mm -hmm. uh, commonly consumed plants and animals. And what we did is we looked at the, comp the components of the protein. So the protein can be dub divided into peptides and peptides further divided into epitopes. And so we looked at about 18,000 autoimmune associated peptides, human autoimmune associated peptides, and looked for overlap between those, peptide, uh, those epitopes and the epitopes present in these 14 organisms. So we looked at pork, beef, lamb, um, as well as rice, quinoa, uh, just a wide variety. And we were looking for outliers. We were looking for finding out, A, for which diseases, which, which animals contain more overlap, and also we were looking for unique overlaps. So what was the process in order to find those unique overlaps? What process did you use to, to find those? Well, so we started by really taking these 18,000 protein epitopes mm -hmm. that have been previously implicated in autoimmune disease, and then we lined those up with the complete protein sequences of these 14 organisms. So pig, dog, quinoa, rice, etc. Right. And so we mapped those and we built this massive database where we can now go and like cross-check each of these epitopes in animals in each specific human, human autoimmune disease. And we looked at over 70 of those. Mm -hmm. and it and you came up with, so what was your conclusion, like at the end of <laughs> all of these different? Well, we, we, what we did is we created indices. Mm -hmm. the, we, we created the GF index, which we Which you've named after yourself. Yes. Gerson Ferreira index. Gerson Ferreira index. And what we did is we created um, graphs that would show which diseases have which overlaps per animal. Mm -hmm. So you can visually uh, see which, per disease, with where, where there is the most overlap, where is the highest risk, potentially, according to theory. And then we created one further layer, which is unique GF index, which finds which animals have most unique associations with that disease. And there we had one massive outlier, which was the pig. Mm -hmm. um, so the pig has roughly 700 unique epitopes that are associated with autoimmune disease. Um, it maxed out our scale. Do you happen to know why the pig was the one? Is it because it just eats anything? Um, do you have any idea as to how that came about, being pig being the number one cause? Yeah. It's a very good question. I guess one could say like genetic similarity definitely plays a role. So a pig is much closer to us than rice would be. Mm -hmm. And so this index for a pig is much higher than it would be for rice. But it's more than that. Like you would not predict because as I also just said, there's like unique epitopes. So if you look right. at like 
total epitopes in like pig or beef, they're similar. But if you look at unique epitopes, there's almost a thousand of those that are only found in the pig and nowhere else. At least in the 14, actually now 25 different food sources mm -hmm. that we've looked at as of today. And it's because it's very similar. Well, it's it. We don't know why. Right. It's, the tissues have more epitope level similarity mm -hmm. than could be just predicted by genetic similarity. But this this study that you've done will now help further studies. So is that on the on the agenda? Not necessarily from you, but in the future for other studies to happen to take a closer look at, at the pig perhaps or other factors that may cause an autoimmune disorder? Absolutely, so the first thing we're doing is we're extending the database. Mm -hmm. So right now we're up to about 25 animals. Okay. Um, additionally, we are trying to communicate with other researchers and share the epitope level data on the published GF index. And where this could lead is hopefully much better, more integrated dietary recommendations for autoimmune sufferers. And that's the bottom goal, or I guess I should say the, the main goal is to get people to avoid having an autoimmune disorder because as you say, it attacks, your body's attacking itself at that point. Correct, there's been many books written about this and I, we hope that we bring like added value because of a systematic analysis of this problem, and it's an immune problem, so use immunology. Mm -hmm. to understand this problem. Mm -hmm. And so actually our first paper got published this month is Journal of, of, of Autoimmune, of Translational Immunity. Mm -hmm. It's available online, open access. If you just Google Immunodietica, we're the first and only result on Google, and so you'll find our finalized first paper. And that's where you this. can find all of the information that more than we've just discussed today, in more detail, we can find out more from the Immunodiatica. I'm sorry, I can't really say that word. Immunodiatica. <laughs> thank you, yes, yeah. the, so more people can find it that way. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much for sharing this study. It's, um, it's very interesting, and I can't wait to see what happens next. Thank you so Thanks much. Thanks for having thank us. You. And Newton News will be right back. Dinner at my house. Delicious, jarred sauce. Time to recycle. Where'd you come from? <laughs> I'm your recycling person. Oh gosh, it's gotta be clean. What? You can't recycle. Oh no, Dana, you're putting it all in a plastic bag. Yes, clean cardboard. Oh, look at your, oh, you've got all this squishy plastic. You know what it does? What? It jams up all the machines. How about this stuff? Can't go in your recycling. This you can take back to your grocery store, but not in your green cart. How about when I put the recyclables in? Absolutely not. No plastic bags. Yes, Something that's like the way that. to do that. Clean it and don't do the plastic bags. Thanks, everybody. Two of New TV's co-op students from Northeastern University, Sophia Chanka and Bryce Dearden, are wrapping up their six-month stint by showcasing their documentary, The International Dream. Welcome to you both. It's so good to have you here, even though it's your last week. But tell us a little bit about this very interesting documentary that you put, you put together. So uh, we're both college students, and uh, one thing you learn very quickly in college is that college is very hard. Um, and basically, you know, we looked at it as, you know, it's going to be even harder if you're thousands and thousands of miles from your family and your friends and where you grew up and it's a different language, different culture, all these different things. So we really wanted to look at what these students see in studying the U.S. and studying at Northeastern that to them makes it worth it and what they're willing to sort of put up with in the process to, to make that happen and what they think it's going to open up for them opportunities-wise in the future. Yeah. And um, I'm an international student. Mm -hmm. I was born in, and raised in Italy. Um, so I moved here just for college. And, but my mom's American, so I didn't have to go through the whole bureaucratic process of you know, getting a visa and doing all that. But I still like to think of myself as an international student because You're an international student. Yeah, <laughs> I don't feel very American, even though I am also mm -hmm. American. So it was interesting to look at that point of view and see, because we have a lot of international friends, mm -hmm. so it was interesting to look at, hear their stories and see how different it was from mine and kind of like research that and get more into that. So 
Is that what gave you the idea? Was like, okay, this is my story. I want to hear what other stories are. Yeah, we we sh we have a lot of international friends, mm -hmm. um, and from we have friends from South America and Africa and Asia and Europe and you know everyone had these really interesting parts of their story that was the same even though they're from such different places but then there are obviously going to be differences coming from all those different parts of the world so that's that's what really gave us the idea is looking at all those similarities and differences and what is sort of fundamental to just studying abroad versus what is more specific and different from region to region what was the biggest fear i guess from each one of your your interviewees Biggest fear. Some people, it, it, it really depends. Mm -hmm. um, some people, it's n no one really questioned if it was worth it. Everyone really was yeah. confident that like studying the U.S. was going to be good for their future and mm -hmm. everything. It was more. Um, there was some stress about visas and stuff like because once you um, obtain your visa to come and study in the U.S., it's not like okay, you're good. There's this constant process of them having to keep things up to date and update addresses and you know request forms and get signatures for even the most basic of things. It's even the smallest things like just change, dropping a class. Like they can't drop a class if they don't talk to their advisor first. Because they could lose their visa. Yeah. It's, it's a lot more complicated than uh, it would seem from the outside. And so a lot of them, it wasn't a a constant fear, but mm -hmm. it was something that they were very aware of and that they had been taught to be very mindful of. It must be very stressful for them, not only being in school, but having that pressure of making sure that they're here legally. Exactly, yeah. 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 That's a huge, th that's basically their entire job as an international student and maintaining their visa status, especially with Northeastern where everyone does co-ops and internships and stuff like that. Um, they have to go through a huge long process just to be able to work in the United States. Mm -hmm. And even then, like a lot of times, there's restrictions on pay and stuff like that. So Especially because we do have like an Office of Global Services at school. And talking to the dean, uh, he said that it's they do help, but it's more important than the student has to keep it up like by, its, by himself. Like yeah, he at the end of the day. The one that, they at, need to be the one that. At the end of the day, it's the student's responsibility, yeah. obviously. And so there is a lot more for them to know and just it's a it's a greater mental load, you know, than your average student of all these things they have to keep track of and be aware of. So why did you want to tell their stories? Just to get the word out or is something attracted to you besides being a part of the group kind of? <laughs> but part of it was mostly I think just following our, our curiosity about mm -hmm. it. Um, it was something we didn't really know a lot about and it's also um, a lot of our Friends that are international students um, have had like some increased fears in the past couple of years about if they're going to be able to get maintain visa status and uh, different restrictions and stuff. They actually just added a question to the application form that some people are stressed about. Now they want your social media accounts before they approve you. Oh. So um, it's it, it's just a really interesting aspect to it. That is, um, it's it's one of those things that's very invisible to most to people that don't have to deal with it. Right. But um, it's also very universal to all the international students that go to Northeastern. And Northeastern's the third largest um, like collegiate institution in the country, um, international student population-wise. There's like um, over 19,000 wow. undergraduate international students. So uh, it's a very common thing in Northeastern to you know, have like a, no, uh, multiple international students. What did you guys learn from, from all of this? just for the, the documentary itself. Yeah, I mean, I, again, I didn't know a lot of the, a lot of this stuff about like visas and all that because I didn't have to personally deal with it. Mm -hmm. um, so it was very interesting to look at that because I didn't realize it, what a hassle it is. Um, what else? There, there's a lot of, um, what's really amazing about it is how individual it is. Um, every country, it's a different process. Every country has different requirements. And at the end of the day, it's just a very like instant pass-fail on whether or not you're even going to receive your visa. Um, you can go through the entire process, do all your paperwork, and you can go to the embassy, and then in five minutes, the person interviewing you about your visa can just decide yes or no on whether or not you're receiving your visa. And I mean, talking to the staff members in OGS, the Office of Global Services, um, some of the, you know, more fringe, like not fringe, some of the more outside cases of what people have to deal with. I think, was it Afghanistan or Iran? 
Iran. Iranian students, no U.S. mail carrier would deliver mail to Iran. So if you're an Iranian student and you want to study at Northeastern, you have to go to a neighboring country to get all of your documents and all yeah. your information. Like it's very complicated, the, the process. To, I have no idea. Yeah. <laughs> we can all learn something from this. Yeah. So with your internship here at New TV, how, how did this, I guess, internship enable you to, to complete this project? I mean, what did you guys learn here? I mean, I personally learned a lot because I came in with knowing not a lot, I feel like, because um, I was, I mean, I'm still learning, mm -hmm. but. Um, I think we all are. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um, so I definitely learned a lot of practical stuff and technical, but also more of like how to deal with a lot of things. Like I didn't know how to put together a documentary before coming here. And mm -hmm. so that definitely helped. I already had a good amount of the technical knowledge coming in, but um, working on the projects that I've been able to here and like having the real dedicated time to practice it and do more of it, it's really enabled me to, I feel now that I'm a lot more able to piece together stories and put together cohesive pieces mm -hmm. as opposed to just sort of, you know, throwing something together that's like, oh, look at this thing. And now it's more like, Here's a person. Here's their story. Here's their story. Like it. It feels. I, I've definitely gotten better in ways that I did not expect um, in my time working here at New TV. So, with these newly found skills or um, enhanced skills, what's next for you guys? You gonna continue on in video production? I know you're you're going back to class after <laughs> yeah. the break, but um, yeah. what's next? Um, I mean, <laughs> that's a great question. Um, I don't know. I mean, it's all very still new, mm -hmm. I would say to me. So I'm still trying to figure that out. Uh, that's why I'm going to take a whole year of classes at trying to like just focus on what I want to do next. Mm -hmm. um, I definitely think I might want to continue. Um, it's, it definitely interests me. Mm -hmm. So. But I also might want to do something else. I don't know. I'm not sure yet. So I'm going to try and you figure it out. You certainly don't soon. have to decide right now. Yeah, it's definitely <laughs> not. Yeah. How about uh, you, Bryce? I'm a, I'm a media and screen studies major. That's mm -hmm. the closest thing Northeastern has to sort of this type of work. Uh, and I'm a film production minor. So it's, it's definitely a field that I'm hoping to go into. Um, next co op, I'm hoping to either co op at the Globe or. Um, probably somewhere in New York or Los Angeles, I'm not really sure. But uh, it's definitely new TV. W working here has definitely given me a lot more confidence in my ability to work in the field moving forward. So I'm excited. Good. Well, congratulations on this fantastic documentary that I'm sure most people will be excited to see. <laughs> and once they see it, you'll be amazed at how great it is. And good luck in the future. I hope to see your name somewhere mm -hmm. out there, yeah. whether it's in lights or wherever it may be. Thank you. But Thanks. good luck to you both. Thanks. So you can watch the International Dream on New TV's Education Channel and online throughout the summer. So here, take a look at the trailer that they produced and get ready because it's coming to New TV. Growing up, you always see America as like a really cool place. It's like this place that's just full of adventure and life. Uh, I, I was still young, like a young age to leave home, completely alone, like I had no one here. There was parts where I didn't know if I was actually going to come here because um, given my, where I was born, Venezuela, I'm a Venezuelan citizen, that complicates things for my visa application process. Me and my family refused to talk about America as something that's sure until I had my passport with the visa in it. My first semester here was pretty hard. So like, it, I would very often wonder like, oh, like, did I do the right thing? Maybe I should've just like went to friends. That's where all my friends are and stuff. Reverse culture shock is the moment of realization that you can't ever go home. You might get back to your native culture and realize people have changed the times have changed and that you need to do some new adjustments yourself. That's it for this week's new news. I'm Jen Adams. If you missed any of this week's newscasts, you can watch it online at newtv.org. Thanks for watching and we'll see you next week. New news was brought to you in part by The Village Bank. Your village, your bank.